so uh, good evening friends and good morning uh, dr sundar uh, hope it's uh, you know reasonably good time for you to get up early in the morning uh, for the second presentation we have a good friend here dr sundar mudalia from uh, san diego uh, he is clinical professor of medicine university of california san diego and also staff physician at the va san diego he trained in india england and united states so he has a global training clinical professor of medicine at university of california principal investigator in some of the landmark trials and he also you know gave the uh, some very important uh, background concept of the fuel energetics uh, in improving the outcomes in uh, with sclt2 inhibitors So, Dr. Sundar is going to uh, discuss the SCLD2 inhibitors and kidney outcome trials. Over to you, sir. Okay. Uh, can you see my screen, please? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for the kind invitation, and it was a wonderful talk by Dr. Tuttle. And uh, two year, three years ago at the American Society of Nephrology, uh, we both presented together, typically the same subjects. I. Uh, presented on sglt2 inhibitors and she did it on glp1 uh, receptor agonist and she's done such a magnificent job that i have uh, big shoes to fill going forward but i'll do my best so the topic you gave me was sglt2 inhibitors and kidney outcome trials and i kind of added this in at the last minute sweet success for the diabetic kidney uh, this is not my uh, title and this is from people in uh, university of washington in the bur and uh, steve khan a good friend of mine so first of all my conflict of interest disclosures are up there i do speak fast as anica mostly in the middle east and i do get research support from the nih so i've got three objectives today first i will describe describe the results of renal outcomes with the stlt2 inhibitors and describe how as dr tatal said a serendipitous secondary outcome for you know finding in the original cvots and also in the recent heart failure studies but proven by dedicated primary outcome studies in with kidney outcomes then i thought i would just review criteria to define kidney renal outcomes it's all over the place to a non nephrologist albuminuria is it should we use albuminuria egfr decline dialysis renal transport transplantation renal death and finally a subject near and dear to my heart uh, potential mechanisms what if, why would we get such profound renal benefits in addition to cardiac benefits and as uh, you know was pointed out earlier the heart failure and ckd benefits actually were a serendipitous finding in the cvots nobody when empreg was presented in september 2015 everybody was like wow but it was mace outcomes heart failure was by the way over there replicated in canvas and then <clears throat> declared to me for dapa they were very uh, how do i say clever they went in and modified and had a two co primary endpoint because that was a lower risk population they put heart failure right up over there now the heart and the kidney are connected that's why heart failure and uh, kidney failure kind of tend to go together the heart pumps more than 1 lakh times every day thousands of liters of blood is being pumped and one one fifth of the cardiac output goes to the kidney to do its job over there and the kidney the glomerular filtrate is 180 liters per day if you don't have renal failure so clearly disease of the one affects the other and of course as we all know ckd patients are about up to six times more likely to die of heart disease than they will get to end stage renal disease and heart failure is a big problem in patients with ckd now that's a bad news the good news dr tuttle has very nicely shown us how the proven therapies for uh, ckd as arbs sglt2 inhibitors glp1 has come on to it but as she pointed out we have to wait for the flow study for a dedicated but all the uh, indicators are pointing in the right direction and of course the non steroidal mineral corticoids phenirenone of late which she very so elegantly described but look at the proven therapies for heart failure now the heart failure society of america esc all of them say you have to have people on this no more going step by step by step start together two two at a time don't wait months 
wait perhaps weeks to a month. Arnis are there, SGLT2 inhibitors, beta blockers, and mineral corticoid receptor uh, antagonists. So SGLT2s are there in both places, and MRAs are there in both places. And so far, the data is not as strong as it is for SGLT2 inhibitors, but obviously I'm biased. First came out in the EMPA reg outcome study, which showed that in patients with diabetes had high CV risk, slower progression of kidney disease, replicated in canvas. These are all secondary outcomes. Again, slower per progression of uh, uh, kidney disease. Dapagliflozin, declared to me, again, showing beneficial effects on renal outcome. And last but not the least, even the vertus, which you know was a little controversial, but again, it had effects on renal composite outcomes, but all secondary outcomes. And of course, those are exploratory outcomes. You need to confirm them. And that came with credence. And Dr. Tuttle uh, briefly alluded to it. But in credence, in 4,400 patients with type 2 diabetes, albuminuric CKD, almost a gram of proteinuria, mean EGFR, this is what we see in our clinic, about 56. Canagliflozin decreased the primary outcome of end-stage kidney disease, doubling of creatinine or renal CV death by 30%. Renal specific outcomes, ESRD is defined there, dialysis, transplant, doubling of creatinine by 34%, and MACE by 20%, hospitalization for heart failure by 39%. I have to point out that this... Uh, uh, decline in uh, the EGFR, doubling of creatinine and all are kind of all together. Some people say 40% decline and sustained decline in uh, EGFR. Some people say 50 and doubling of serum creatinine actually is a 57%. But be that as it may, it was primary outcome was proven. And the study was stopped early by the DSMB. Along comes uh, the uh, DAPA CKD study, but now patients with and without diabetes, about a third of the patients did not have diabetes. Again, 4,000 odd patients, again, albuminuric CKD. Now the EGFR is lower, 43. What did DAPA do? Reduce the primary outcome of a sustained decline in EGFR 50%. There it was 57%. And of course, go, you know, going on to ESRD or renal, they added CV death over there, kind of a little bit to hedge their bet, 39%. And of course, the secondary, if you take away CV death, it's still 44%. CV death, heart failure, 29 And this study, unlike Credence, all-cause mortality reduced by 31%. This, I think, is really profound and uh, um, something really to note. Again, but this time benefits unlike credence, independent of diabetes status. And again, the study was stopped early by the DSMB. So the re what about, you no? Know, those are the primary uh, outcome studies. So recently we had the three big heart failure studies, CKD heart failure, they go together. So what happens in people who are documented to have heart failure? We had DAPA HF, we had the Emperor Reduced, and we had Emperor Preserved. So first off the block was DAPA heart failure study in patients with reduced ejection fraction, less than 40%. Now this is a heart failure CV death study, but they did have secondary outcomes and the worsening renal function, which they put in as a secondary outcome, look at that over there, hazard ratio 0.71, but not significant. Okay, but this was not powered for that, but suggesting quite strongly that, hey, it might be. So what do they do? Then when they go back and let's look at the EGFR slope, and this is something which is still a little controversial, at least to a non-nephrologist. So they looked at two slopes. We all know, unlike the GLP-1 agonists, like uh, Dr. Tuttle showed, you actually get an increase in the GFR initially. Here with the SGLT2 inhibitors, with DAPA, you get a drop of about four. Is that good or bad? But you know, as with the ACE and ARBs, we know that if you reduce it, it's intraglomerular pressure, which is reduced. And this has long-term benefits. And that is seen, the slope is now in favor of placebo because they don't drop as much. But in the long run, up to two years, now the slope for DAPA has slowed down over there. And the difference in slope is significant, although 
technically you should not use the word significant. New England Journal will not allow you to use it because it was not specified and powered for that. Anyway, coming to the emperor reduced heart failure study. Now look at this. Their mean slope EGFR, again, significant. And they also had pre-specified analysis, composite renal outcome. And this was a 40% reduction, unlike 50% for the other one. And now 0 0.50 hazard ratio is well on the other side of unity, but you cannot use a p-value because it is a pre-specified analysis. It's not a designated secondary endpoint, which in and of itself is exploratory. But if you look at the EGFR, which was significant, again, the same thing that we see. Initially, EMPA drops about four, but then flattens out as we as you go through. And the, uh, uh, the over there, ultimately at the end, the slope is a lesser one, almost two ml per year slope, slower with empagliflozin over the two years of the study compared to placebo, which is good. And you can see the lines cross about a year and a half and then uh, EMPA stays flatter. Then just last week, EMPA preserved comes in. Now what did they do? So again, it's a heart failure study. These are all secondary outcomes, but heart failure, kidney failure go together. So they specified the EGFR, CKD, EPI thing. And now what did they find? This was a secondary outcome and it was specified and they tested it in a hierarchical testing procedure. Guess what? The slope is less for EMPA than it is for DAPA, and the p-value is highly significant. But they also had a composite real outcome. And now it was a, a, for more than a 40% reduction. This did not meet it. Of course, in the higher, you know, it, it, you can't give a p-value or anything over there because that's over with the secondary outcomes over there. But, and if you look, this is what they showed that the, uh, I did not attend the ESC. So clearly you can see the difference in slopes that you see. The slope at the end of the study was 1.36 uh, ml slower with EMPA versus placebo. But they did an interesting thing as well. In 3000 patients, they stopped the drug for about a month, month and a half. And then they found that the EGFR deteriorated less. If you look, calculated the slopes, now the slope is far more in favor. It's about a 2.4 versus 1.3 in, in favor of EMPA because they didn't show the real curves. It comes up. And we saw that in EMPA rec. You stop the drug, it's, it's a transient effect on intraglomerular pressure. The EGFR comes back. And in EMPA reg, almost back to baseline. So this is fascinating. But they said very clearly this represents the unconfounded assessment of the treatment effect. But many people dispute this. How can you, uh, you know, not take into account this initial fall? This is the acute slope, the chronic slope. We're looking for the long-term progression. But be that as it may, it is all in favor of an SGLT2 inhibitor, a slower progression to end-stage kidney disease. But in a companion article in the New England Journal of Medicine, the main article was the Emperor Preserve. Um, uh, Dr. Milton Packer from uh, Dallas, he wrote this and he said, although empagliflozin and DAPA have been reported to slow the rate of decline in the, EG, uh, in the, uh, in the estimated EGFR, uh, GFR, changes in EGFR slope may not predict the effects of these drugs on major renal outcomes. And he said that for a while. He says, you, we should not be using the EGFR slope. And he gave this example. On the top is emperor preserved. So look at it. The hazard ratio I showed you over there, 0.95. Again, this is New England Journal. They will not let you put a p-value because this was not the, pre you know, the secondary outcome. Clearly in favor of EMPA. So if you look at the estimated cumulative incidence, about 3% versus 6%. So this is a 50% reduction. But... If you come to the emperor preserve, now the hazard ratio, as I showed you. So he says, there is a discordance. The EGFR is coming down uh, slower with empagliflozin in both studies. But hey, what happened to the major adverse renal outcomes? It is not significant here. But I think to my mind that 
is not an issue and i'll tell you why but the question is does slowing of the egfr translate into less renal outcomes in the long term basically is egfr decline a good surrogate renal endpoint and the fda struggled with this before they approved all the uh, endpoints for the uh, renal dedicated studies what about albuminuria well it's been around for a long time we all check the in fact now most people don't even look at egfr now slowly it's coming everybody is looking at creatinine and trying to translate ek ckd ap equation kdig all the different uh, equations are there so just like mes how can we measure renal outcomes in long term studies so i think most people at least in the nephrology space and dr tuttle can comment on this later the egfr slope is recognized as a pretty good surrogate and this is from some pretty big people including hero hirspink and all that and they said they looked at multiple studies they said if you have a sufficient sample size a treatment effect of 0.7 ml per minute per 1.73 meter square year or greater on the total slope over 3 years or the chronic slope predicts a clinical benefit on ckd progress with 96% probability so yes you can trust the egfr slope and they said with large enough sample size these are thousands of patients g of uh, gfr slope may be a viable surrogate for clinical endpoint because clearly you cannot wait years and years and years although to be fair in the credence and dapa you got those endpoints which were powered for for within two and a half years and the dsmb stopped the study proteinuria i have always said it and uh, uh, you know people uh, dr bakris also said i said albuminuria is a better predictor of cardiovascular disease than it is of kidney disease but if you've always measured it over there this was a large meta analysis 32 uh, in uh, you know studies 9000 patients the five uh, in a uh, evaluating five intervention types you know is arbs other drugs basically they said this is 2014 these results provide new evidence supporting the use of early reduction in proteinuria as a surrogate endpoint but they do not provide sufficient evidence to establish its validity in all settings and dr tuttle very nicely pointed out the discordance between albuminuria and the uh, renal in the i had not known that in with the endothelin receptor antagonist and of course now the renal field is moving like the mace you heard of the mace now you we have to hear of the mare and it's not a female horse and the mare is major adverse renal endpoints and dr bakris is going to be speaking next and he perhaps may want to speak to it but what are hard renal outcomes because proteinuria is soft egfr is soft it's a predictor this is hard so def- depending on how you define it mare is three point mare incident kidney disease eskd death of renal cause mare plus four point mase like five point mase they put it all in but to me as a non nephrologist where is the detail of this it's in the small print the devil is in the detail each one is defined egfr defined as 40% on at least seven creatinine measures resulting in egfr over as defined over two years of slope so this field and i i'd love to hear dr tuttle's thoughts on this uh, mer outcome but bottom line in the dedicated renal endpoint studies credence and dapa sglt2 inhibitors reduce major adverse renal endpoints i think that is very clear and the tantalizing evidence that the glp1 receptor agonist could do it the finironone maybe and the endothelin receptor ag- uh, antagonist but in the cvots and heart failure trials these are not this, these are secondary endpoints sglt2 inhibitors reduce egfr slope for sure and in some studies even major adverse renal endpoints but again they were they are either secondary endpoints or not powered specifically but then to me the bigger question is why would sglt2 inhibitors have such robust effects on heart failure and ckd benefit uh, kidney failure which occur early that's something puzzling and for want of time i i could not use all my other slides 
just to put it into one sentence, several hemodynamic, is it, you know, endothelial function, is it drop in blood pressure, you know, natriuresis, diuresis, metabolic effects, weight loss, uh, all the things, molecular mechanisms, sodium hydrogen ex exchanger one in the heart, sodium hydrogen exchanger three in the kidney, and a whole bunch more things have been postulated, nobody knows yet, to explain the heart failure and CKD prevention benefits of the SGLT2 inhibitors. But in my mind, again, this is my opinion, I don't think they can explain the totality of the cardiovascular and the renal patient uh, benefits in patients with and without diabetes. Before we thought of people, you know, all diabetes, hyperglycemia does a whole host of bad things, inflammation, oxidative stress. But DAPA CKD says, hey, it happens in people without diabetes. DAPA heart failure benefits in people without heart failure. There's no hyperglycemia over there. So where did all that come from? And which drugs do this so early? The heart failure benefits, I couldn't show you the slides over there, occurring within 28 days for Amparec and with, with uh, the other studies, 17, 20 days, less heart failure hospitalization. The CV death occurs within two months, 59 days in Amparec. And CKD benefits take a little longer. They take a few months to occur. In my opinion, all of this in patients with without diabetes, if you want one, at least partly, these changes partly can be ex explained by changes in fuel metabolism because it occurs immediately, unlike the other ones, which take a little time to occur. But then what is the problem with fuel metabolism in diabetes? Well, again, for want of time, I can't do it. I think the crux is hypoxia. Hypoxia in the kidney, hypoxia in the heart. And the, this is a paper from, uh, you know, Volker Wallen, who works in San Diego and is a good friend of mine, and I have long discussions with him. He wrote about, uh, in Kidney International, the role of renal hypoxia in the pathogenesis of diabetic kidney disease, a promising target for newer renoprotective agents, including SGLT2 inhibitors. And he said in diabetes, there's a lot of increased ATP demand, hyperfiltration, uh, uh, you know, tubular growth. See, hyperfiltration, you're pushing more stuff down, but the problem is the tubule has to take it all back. And it doesn't come free. You have to expend energy to take all that back. The glomerulus has the easiest job. It just filters it through. The energy for the glomerulus is coming from the heart. The heart pumps the blood through. The glomerulus is just a filter. The other part of the kidney, the tubule, it is doing all the hard work. It is doing pumping it all back. There's a proper regulation, RAS activation, vasopressin. And of course, on the other side, not only is there increased demand, there is decreased gen de uh, generation of ATP for various reasons. You know, less oxygen supply, uh, you know, decreased oxygen, uh, you know, fuel utilization, more of AMPK, mitochondrial dysfunction. And the one point I learned in the kidney is in all other organs in the heart, if you have hypoxia, what do you do? Increase blood flow. Well, at least you put more flow over there, you might get it unless your uh, PO2 is very low. In the kidney, you can't do it. If you put more blood flow to the kidney, guess what? It is filtered and the tubule has to work even harder to get everything back. So that's a problem for the kidney, especially in the inner medulla. Of course, in uh, September 2016, we put our hypothesis saying, can a shift in fuel energetics explain the beneficial outcomes of Amparag. And we said, we postulate that the cardiorenal benefits are due to a shift in the metabolism away from fat and glucose, which are energy inefficient in the setting of the diabetic heart and the kidney and towards an energy efficient superfuel like ketone bodies, which improve work efficiency and function. Unfortunately, for want of time, I, I, I have studied renal fuel metabolism across the segments, the proximal tubule, S1, S2, S3, the loop of Henle, the descending limb, ascending limb tube. It is fascinating. Each segment has got a preferred fuel over there, but ketone bodies are a super fuel. Again, why? Because ultimately, whatever we do in the body, whether it is to grow our hair, grow our nails, pump the heart, you know, the kidney, you need ATP. That is the universal currency in the human body. And you can gauge it by what's known as the PO ratio. How much ATP moles do you make 
per atom of oxygen consumed in the electron transport chain. Something like a miles per gallon, kilometers per liter. Glucose is the best fuel, 2.58, provided it goes the whole thing around in the uh, Krebs cycle. Palmitic acid, C16, one of the fatty acids, it's 2.33. It's about 11% less, but remember, minute to minute, beat to beat, uh, it is not so efficient. Plus, it is a dirty fuel because it generates more reactive oxidative species. That's well known. That's one of the reasons the brain will not use fatty acids and prefers ketones because the brain is a closed compartment, cannot deal with too much of oxidative stress. But beta hydroxybutyrate is 2.50. It's one, a cleaner fuel. It's water soluble and three, actually the inherent heat of that equation over there is far better than even glucose. But as I said, small changes in fuel energetics occur immediately and minute to minute, they could translate into large benefits over weeks to months. It's like you're on a slope and you're struggling. You reduce the slope, you can go faster. And if you have a better fuel, you go far longer distances. Quick question on, why is there ketogenesis with SGLT2 inhibitor treatment? No other diabetes drug does that. In fact, tell me which other drug is causing ketogenesis. That has always puzzled me a lot. And I really cannot go into the details. People initially called it a pathological phenomenon. And I said, no, and we published this in our paper. It's a physiological adaptation to fuel metabolism because there is continued loss of glucose, an essential nutrient in the urine, even if you're fasting. How much? About 100 grams in type 2 diabetes. 50 grams if you don't have diabetes and your fasting is about 90. And clearly, if you have kidney disease, it is even less, 10, 20 grams. But there is a continuing leak of glucose. And think about it. If your glucose is going out all the time, your blood sugar will come to zero. Or you have to eat all the time to keep your good sugars up because you're leaking it out over there. There has to be some uh, hemostasis. Uh, so, sorry. There has to be some hemostasis. And no, for some reason, my... Is it progressing? Okay, there. Sorry. Sorry about that. So that loss of glucose is countered by an upregulation of SGLT1 transporters. Actually, it's not, a, it's not an upregulation. Volker Wallen always says, he says they're there, they're just sleeping over there. The moment it comes, they have high affinity, but low capacity. They only can take about 50%. So if you filter out to about 180 grams, you still will leak out 90 grams. So what about the other 90? The liver increases it's hepatic production to supply the tissues. There's some evidence that the kidney also may do it. Why do we need the glucose? Why can't we use fat and ketones? Because there are three tissues which are almost completely dependent on glucose. The red blood cell has got no nucleus, no mitochondria. It cannot live if there is no glucose. It has to do glucose uh, uh, to the lactate thing. The inner medulla of the kidney, the PO2, depending on which uh, reference, about 10, 15 millimeters, not enough to support oxidative phosphor phosphorylation. And the brain takes time to switch to ketones and doesn't like fatty acids over there. So the liver takes as, uh, acetyl, uh, you know, acetyl-CoA comes into it, cannot go into the Krebs cycle, acetoacetate, acetoacetate, acetyl-CoA, uh, acetyl-CoA is acetoacetate, and uh, exported out uh, as beta hydroxybutyrate. It's an alternative fuel. It's about twice fasting in the fast, uh, twice the baseline levels. So if you have no diabetes, it goes from about 0 0.1, 0 0.2 to 0 0.3, 0 0.4. If you have diabetes, around 0.3 to 0.6, and it tracks that even after a meal. And actually, we wrote that in our paper. An SGLT2 inhibitor is similar to the state of accelerated starvation in pregnancy. I know the previous session was on GDM. Remember, the fetus is mainly glycolytic. It doesn't have the machinery for fatty acid oxidation. And a woman, you starve a woman, they go very quickly into uh, ketosis. That's why women need to eat all the time. And I know it, the question was asked of Dr. Idian Vela, glucose levels run far lower. That's one of the effects of you leaking out uh, glucose. So, just, I, I will finish before my time, uh, so uh, uh, there. But that's all diabetes. What about people who don't have diabetes? Well, it's the 
pleiotropic effects of ketone bodies because beta hydroxybutyrate is more than just a fuel substrate. We knew this only in the 1980s that, hey, this is another fuel substrate. And of course, this is a very nice paper in cell metabolism. Beta hydroxybutyrate has got receptors, the not like protein three inflammasome, quite powerful effects to block inflammation. This is probably why the effects occur in IgA nephropathy in the DAPA CKD. Uh, NLRP3 plays a major role there. HCAR2 blocks lipolysis, free fatty acid receptor lowers the metabolic rate. This is fascinating. Histone deacetylators, the sirtuins, uh, you know, partly through FOXO reduces oxidative stress, inflammatory stress, and of course, beta hydroxybutyrate can promote longevity. So, bottom line is ketone bodies are not only a fuel uh, uh, source, they suppress oxidative stress, they've got anti inflammatory effects, they've got powerful effects on the powerhouse of the cell, mitochondrial biogenesis and, and function. This is uh, one of my uh, figures, it's, the paper is still under review. In fact, one of the reviewers said this picture is too gaudy, tone it down. But I'm, <laughs> I'm going to try and appeal that. Anyway, SGLT2 inhibitors block the transporters in the proximal segment. You get loss of glucose, essential nutrient, accelerated starvation, accelerated lipolysis, ketogenesis, about twice baseline. It is beta hydroxybutyrate, more beta hydroxybutyrate, improve fuel energetics improve myocardial and renal oxygen consumption and work efficiency. And these powerful effects, I don't have time to go in, NLRP3, FFAR, antioxidative stress, hypoxia, HIF1, there's more erythropoietin, there's an increased hematocrit, which increases the oxygen carrying capacitor of all this SGLT2 inhibitors, antifibrotic effects seen in humans in uh, uh, kidney specimens, mTOR C1, improve myocardial uh, function, Antisympathetic effects through GPR41. This is because unlike GLP-1 receptor agonists, SGLT2 inhibitors do not increase the heart rate. The blood pressure falls, the heart rate has to go up, does not go up with this. Bottom line, less myocardial and renal damage, less heart failure over there. But caveat, the data is mostly preclinical. There is clinical data. I don't have time to show you. It is not definitive by any means. It's far stronger for the car, for heart failure, cardiac output than it is for renal. It's a little uh, fuzzy still. Of course, you have the other effects of the uh, SGLT2 inhibitors, which are ketone independent, hemodynamic, vascular, metabolic, uh, molecular, all of them. Few points. SGLT2 inhibitors have not been studied in CKD without proteinuria. The AMPA kidney is going to look at that. Not studied in type 1 diabetes not studied in polycystic kidney disease. They were excluded, not studied in lupus nephritis, ANCA, for which you use other drugs, immune suppressants and all of this. But chronic glomerulonephritis, uh, CKD, hypertensive CKD, IgA nephropathy CKD, yes, SGLT2 inhibitors. Finally, I always like to start with history. I've used this slide so many times. The first description of diabetes and its treatment is about 5,000 years this is Hesi Ra, a physician around 3000 BC. This was a stamp issued by Egypt in 1971. And this papyrus is available today in the University of Leipzig. And he described a disease like diabetes with polyuria. And he said to treat it, you know, take a measuring glass, fill it with water from the bird pound, fresh milk, beer, cucumber, mix it into one, take it for four days and the kidney. I mean, he 5,000 years ago, before you know, uh, the Greeks and the Indians figured out that, hey, this is uh, the kidney. Of course, uh, 5,000 years later, we had the keto diet with uh, Elliot Jocelyn, the discovery of insulin, SGLT2 inhibitors. And in when they came out in 2013, people said, turning symptoms into therapy. And many people said, you're going to destroy the kidney. You're going to fill it with sugar. Of course, I forgot to tell, there is a slight numerical excess of urinary infections, gentle infections for sure, and may, you know, DKA, not really a problem in Credence and, uh, and uh, uh, DAPA heart, uh, HF, DAPA CKD. Very few or less with the uh, SGLT2 inhibitors. And, you know, Subodh Verma, a good friend of mine, he said, the pump, the pipe and the filter, do they cover it all? The pump is heart failure, I would suggest the kidney is also a pump. The pipe is the epicardial arteries. 
It produces uh, uh, coronary artery disease, the filter of causes, kidney failure. Do they cover it all? Yes. I know I have just a minute to go. I'm looking at my clock. And in JAMA, they said a novel cardioprotective therapy that improves glycemia. I would suggest probably cardiorenal protective therapy. But let me finish with this from uh, the, the uh, kidney literature. SGLT2 inhibition requires reconsideration of fundamental paradigms in CKD. Diabetic nephropathy, I didn't go into DKD, CKD, IG nephropathy, and photocytopathy. But look at this, he said. There are many potential indications. One is for sure. Nephrology after DAPA CKD will not be the same as it was before. Finally, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Sundar. Uh, 